Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Minister Baines, and uh, thank you, Dominic, as well. Uh, I'm Sean Silkoff. I write about uh, innovation technology for the Globe and Mail, and I also co-wrote a book, which you should all read, about uh, the rise and fall of BlackBerry. Uh, so uh, a few weeks ago, I wrote a, a story for the Globe with a title, uh, Is Ottawa's Super Cluster Funding Initiative a Super Boondoggle in the Making? So when I came here and saw the spinal surgery uh, convention was on, I thought, oh, they sent me to the wrong place. Um, <laughs> So uh, before I uh, introduce our guests, I want to sort of set the stage a bit and build on what we've heard from the minister and uh, from Mr. Barton. So uh, uh, big question, as uh, Mr. Baines is, uh, gets all the time, is what is a super cluster, other than the fact that it's a cluster and it's super? Um, I actually think we should just drop super and refer to them as clusters, um, but maybe you disagree. Um, seriously, a uh, cluster, of course, was uh, the term was coined by Michael Porter about 30 years ago as a geographic concentration of interconnected companies and institutions in a particular field that drive productivity, innovation, and the creation of new businesses. Uh, we know of some of the world's most famous clusters. So I think of Hollywood, uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, Japan's electronics industry, uh, the agri-food industry in the Netherlands. Uh, and of course, government has played, uh, I have to acknowledge, has played a key role um, in, uh, in, in helping uh, with innovation and, and with clusters, particularly in Silicon Valley. Uh, if you haven't read The Entrepreneurial State by Mariana uh, Mazzucato, she goes uh, into that in great detail. Uh, so clusters are economic engines that drive wealth, jobs, and innovation. Uh, and when you look at uh, this program, at the heart of each of the five superclusters will be a nonprofit agency that will coordinate activity and fund innovative and collaborative uh, commercial projects proposed by each of its members. Uh, the key uh, to this whole program is collaboration. The idea that if you smash a bunch of industries and players of various sizes together, uh, basically magic will happen. Uh, and, uh, but of course, there's lots of questions, and hopefully we'll get to some of those today. Uh, is this truly an industry-led effort, as the government would have us believe? Uh, or is this something that's really been uh, engineered by an activist uh, uh, administration? Uh, Ottawa has failed to move the needle on economic growth in the past with innovation policies. So is this smart policy, uh, or is it more of the same? Uh, is it a regional development subsidization plan? Uh, we'll note, a number of people have noted that the distribution of the clusters is rather neat and conspicuous across the country. Uh, and uh, is it corporate welfare? Uh, Mr. Mr. Bain says no. Uh, will this create wealth at home, or is it an opportunity for foreign companies to spirit valuable intellectual property out of the country? So looking forward to discussing some of these issues. Uh, I'll introduce our, our uh, panelists now. Um, I'll go in, I think, alphabetical order. Uh, Matt Hebb, number two, put your hand up. Uh, he's the Assistant VP of Government Relations and Economic Development with uh, Dalhousie University and the Interim CEO of the Ocean Supercluster, uh, one of the five winners. Louis Roy, in the middle, uh, is founder and president of Optel, which is a successful uh, Quebec City uh, tech firm uh, and the lead company in the Scale.ai uh, uh, supply chain supercluster in Montreal, Quebec. Uh, Jan De Silva, to my immediate left, is President and CEO of the Toronto Region Board of Trade and a member of the Board of the Advanced Manufacturing Supercluster in Southern Ontario. So we have three cluster uh, representatives here. Uh, she used to run Sun, Life's finan Sun Life Financial's Hong Kong business as well. Uh, Jameson Stevie, over there. Uh, he's Executive Director of the Martin Prosperity Institute and the Institute for Competitiveness and Prosperity at Rotman. At U of T, uh, which has done a lot of uh, research on clusters over the years. And before that, he served as principal secretary in the office of Premier Dalton McGuinty. And finally, Ilsa Trudnik over there, uh, former head of Mars, uh, chairperson of the board of Triphase Accelerator Corp, and was a member of uh, Minister Morneau's Growth Council along with uh, Dominic Barton. Um, so uh, just a reminder to everyone, we're using uh, Slido for uh, questions, so I encourage you to uh, submit your questions, they will be graded, and I'll ask a couple of them at the end if we have some time. Uh, so, Ilsa, let's start with you. Uh, we've just heard uh, Dominic reflect on what the Growth Council achieved. The Council proposed something similar to uh, superclusters, but not quite the same thing called innovation marketplaces. Uh, the idea, though, was more to fund quite a number of initiatives. I think it was about 10 or 12. Kind of throw to the wall, see what stuck, and um, then sort of go full steam with a handful of winners, I think three to five, rather than, um, uh, rather than trying this out first, um, 
or sorry, uh, see which demonstrates success. Do you think it was a mistake for the government to go full steam uh, ahead with five winners like they're doing now? Um, uh, should they have tried this out, experimented first, and then gone for the best ones? Um, well, I think nomenclature is aside, um, it's important to focus first on sort of where the overlapping intents were. And um, I think those are, there are several of them, but the key ones are, you know, a, a desire both from the Growth Council and from the government side to um, more directly focus on some of our areas of strength. We've run the experiment of indirect investment through SHRED for some years, and um, this was a different approach. Um, the second piece was obviously the focus on collaboration. I think we have lots of evidence around the world that we, um, that these type of collaborations are becoming more and more important as the pace changes. And that new models of collaboration to very intentionally focus on the Canadian challenge of how do we get to density and scale, um, in, and, and in particularly some of our more fragmented industries. So that, that focus of going straight at the collaboration piece I think was critical. The third, I think, was to take a slightly more holistic approach than the direct investments in the past, which was sort of betting on one firm and one mandate. Here, it was more betting on an area of the economy um, and hopefully getting the spillover effects on talent, um, attracting, retaining, developing, on uh, involving SMEs, on identifying the regulatory barriers that need to be there so that hopefully these collaborative models can sustain. Um, and then I think the other force that really informed, I think, both, uh, both debates was uh, a serious concern about the pace at which um, digitization and some of these exponential technologies are impacting multiple sectors at the same time, and the opportunity, particularly in the AI space, to learn from the applications into multiple sectors. So I think we came at it from a common place. The, the design difference... Um, is really set in the context. The Growth Council recommendations around marketplaces were nestled in a suite of recommendations very much focused on innovation and um, with a primary driver on how do we scale our best young emerging firms. So it's sat adjacent to the risk capital initiative, regulatory reform, talent, uh, and so on. While I think the supercluster approach with its, um, its bigger bets and with its uh, industry-led focus and, and larger plays, um, perhaps pushed it more into a more traditional economic development because the cash upfront requirements um, then shifted the focus to the needs of the larger firms. Um, from the Growth Council's perspective, our marketplaces, when you try to really identify the needs of the young high-growth firms and you want them to lead that process and put skin in the game, you've got to use the innovation uh, toolbox of iterating and scaling and so on. We recognize that that would be a really hard program for government to implement. Um, but honestly, we also felt that probably given the pace of change, it was a worthwhile experiment uh, for the simple reason that uh, in the future, we will probably have to do more of that from a policy implementation perspective. Um, I think now that we have the super clusters, um, I'm hopeful that we can take a lot of those intentions and uh, make sure that they get implemented. And the focus there is really how do we make sure the engagement of the SMEs is robust, um, that their interests are uh, front and center, and that, that will uh, rely heavily on leadership and governance inside the super clusters. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jameson, even before the winners were announced, a lot of people were saying this program uh, was already a success. Uh, because it had such a, a wide variety of uh, stakeholders talking to each other uh, in a way they hadn't before. I'm wondering if you thought, uh, what you thought about the fact that we have 50 bids, um, I think a thousand companies, dozens of universities um, came together, uh, that, and then nine shortlisted applications and five finalists. Uh, that means the government received a lot of data, uh, maybe that it didn't have before on the assets and, and the potential uh, assets across the country, industries. What do you think the government should do with all of this stuff that it's now collected and, and this effort that's been done, not, aside from the five superclusters? What, what, what can it do with this accumulation of new data? Sell it. No. Um, <clears throat> I, would, I would say, you know, there were two processes going on at the same time, and it was really interesting to watch. So you had Amazon's HQ2 process going on, and the media coverage of that was, you know, there's this genius company that's collecting data from around the world, and they're having this beauty contest, and they're going to steal all that information and use that to allocate the resources going forward. Meanwhile, government was doing something 
almost exactly the same, 50,000 jobs, same amount that HQ2 is going to be, and it was described as slow and bureaucratic, and oh my gosh, this is a waste of time. Um, so what does government do with that, that information? I mean, sure, we can celebrate the five winners, that's interesting, but they have an opportunity to draw arguably the modern Canadian industrial map. They have, they have 50 submissions with people who have started to work together. And I would, I would build off of Ilsa's comments, which is just a wise thing to do generally. Not only do we have fragmented industries, we're a fragmented country. We, we, we stay small, we incentivize ourselves to stay small, and our geography sometimes forces us to do so. So while I wouldn't go as far as to say just talking to each other, you know, to, your, to use your language, smash things together and the magic will happen. Um, you know, on behalf of Michael Porter, I'm not sure if he would, he would agree with that's the entirety of his thesis, but um, um, you know, I think getting those people to work together was but one step. What they should do with that data now is how do you make sure the ability to convene is also uh, augmented by the ability to cajole? How do you make sure that those people work together going forward? Because I don't think there was that big of a difference between the fifth winner and the first loser. So how do you make sure we start to get some economic activity from submissions six through 50? Um, because this is gonna be significant going forward. That's number one. And then number two, how do you make sure the intellectual property that's been generated out of that process can be used to influence policy not only within Minister Bain's ministry, but Ministry of Finance and others going forward? Mm, well, to apply Olympic language to the supercluster, isn't it, you don't want to be in sixth place? In, in this <laughs> well, probably, but, I, but that's okay. I, I also don't think we don't want Canada to be in second place. So how do we take that sixth position and make sure that they're part of the economy going forward? Okay. Jen, uh, Toronto has uh, experimented uh, with uh, cluster type initiatives in the past in uh, health and food and beverage. Uh, what can you tell us and what can we learn about these past initiatives in terms of opportunities and benefits that we'll see out of the super cluster program? Yeah, I'd like to contrast what we've done in the past and how the super cluster initiative really just was a catalyst for a much faster galvanization of activity. We're big fans of the Porter model. Uh, there's seven major tradable clusters in Toronto. And for us to grow as a region, it's all about how do we make these clusters globally competitive. We did work uh, years, a few years before I even joined uh, the board with the human health sciences. I mean, through Mars, and we've got this amazing community. It took us three years of hard work to try to get the key stakeholders in that community thinking like a cluster and trying to figure out what's in it to them, for them to work together. They've now uh, formed into an organization called TO Health, very, very focused on branding the assets that are in uh, this amazing human health sciences system. Great, uh, great for us, lots of potential there. If I look at the advanced manufacturing super cluster, the fact that it was a business-led initiative, the fact that there was a government incentive for them to be working together, that created a catalyst for them to sit at the table and say, let's figure out if there is something meaningful that we can work on. And because it had to be business-led, business was happy to be at the table because it meant a number of other players who were interested had to stand down until business had figured it out. So I was very positive about the process, and I'd be happy to go into some examples of how that unfolded. Okay. Um, uh, let's come back to that. Uh, Matt, um, uh, talking about the smashing together, I, I, I think actually that did happen in the, with the oceans cluster. Maybe t you told me a few weeks back that uh, what this process did was actually bring together a whole bunch of industries that actually work basically shoulder to shoulder on the ocean but never had actually talked, talked to one another. What did the process um, bring out? And, and maybe tell us a little bit about what conversations have unfolded since then and, and, and then what that does in terms of setting your priorities for the first year uh, as, uh, as the cluster gets underway. Sure. Um, so I think we, we start from the premise that uh, you know, Canada, um, whether it knows it or not, is an ocean nation. And, and we can look at, at other places and see in a, in a fairly objective way that there is an opportunity to drive an, a lot more value sort of socially and economically from the ocean than, than what Canada currently does. If we look at a, at a country like Norway with, a, with an economy the fifth the size of Canada's, the absolute value of their ocean economy is seven times larger than Canada's. Um, we have the longest coastline in the world. We have one of the largest concentrations of ocean PhDs. We have a, we have a modern navy. Uh, we have uh, advanced uh, uh, research capabilities in federal labs and agencies that are, that are world class. Um, and we've got uh, uh, incredible uh, uh, SMEs that are, that are producing tech that's used uh, all around the world. And we've got a diversified set of uh, companies in, in all the major verticals. So, so why, why is that so? Um, 
the, the, the answer that we've started to put forward with the ocean supercluster is that uh, the companies that are operating uh, out there in the ocean um, and that share an awful lot of um, uh, uh, challenges uh, in common uh, don't in fact uh, work together on them. Uh, the ocean is a complex and a costly place uh, to, to undertake any kind of activity. And, and so for any one firm or any one sector to take on uh, fundamental operating challenges like, like the ability to monitor the ocean environment and, and whether you're concerned about um, avoiding uh, whales in, in uh, trade lanes um, or monitoring uh, the potential for a, for a, for a deep freeze uh, or a deep chill uh, in, a, in an aquaculture pen. Um, it's really uh, challenging for your sectors to take that on uh, independently. Um, but the opportunity to come together and collaborate across sector lines uh, on some of these shared challenges is, um, uh, turns out to be uh, uh, really promising and something that's of great interest to, uh, to, uh, to Canadian ocean-based companies. Um, so what we will be trying to focus on in the first year is to really build unity of purpose um, around that common opportunity in a way that um, maintains a market pull coming from the main ocean end users for the kinds of innovations uh, that can contribute to um, both competitive advantage for the companies that are working in the ocean, whether it's oil and gas companies or aquaculture companies, um, marine renewables and, and so on, uh, as well as creating new larger markets for the ocean uh, tech companies that are producing, um, that are producing this incredible uh, you know, sensors, data, platforms and so on. Um, we think it'll also be a good opportunity for new entrants into the ocean economy that are already um, uh, present and diffuse in, in other sectors of the uh, sort of the land-based economy, if I can call it that. Um, so, so the things that we want to get right in year one are really that that unity of purpose um, and a framework that will allow us to um, identify some opportunities and and get some early success because of the fact that we're gonna we're gonna face you know culture differences and and process differences between the different sectors that, that haven't typically worked together and, and some of those things are going to need to be sorted out and I think um, uh, nothing like nothing like early success uh, to be able to uh, to uh, shake out uh, some of those issues early on okay thanks um, Louis, uh, you're, uh, like some of the other groups, your group brings together a, a, quite an eclectic mix. Uh, you've got BCE, Couchetard, CGI. Do you have the Cirque du Soleil in there? I was practically expecting to see them on the list. Um, and of course, AI experts from, from Quebec, um, a world-renowned center of AI. Uh, maybe walk us through a little bit the opportunity for Canada to, uh, like, what we'll see unfold out of your group. Like, what's the cohesive narrative that will flow from, from, from what you think you can achieve? And, and what kind of an industry or, or uh, champions will be built out of, out of what comes out of Scale.ai? So uh, we, we have two goals. Uh, the, the first goal is to help Canadian uh, supply chain. And supply chain touch all the other cluster. Uh, we have the fish supply chain. We have the, the green protein supply chain. We have the healthcare supply chain. And uh, so supply chain, by the way, is uh, the source of uh, most of the problem that uh, humanity is facing currently, either uh, uh, climate change, uh, water disparity, and pollution, uh, overfishing, or et cetera. It, it's a supply chain issue. So uh, the idea of this cluster was to revamp uh, supply chain, build a new ecosystem, and with the help of uh, artificial intelligence to bring us, helping us to make the right decision. So, uh, first goal is to deploy the, those ecosystem that will be usable for all Canadian industry to, to, to take the edge, also be more competitive, comply more faster to um, regulation, uh, global regulation. Second uh, objective, which is Yes, part of my first objective. So uh, I'm the CEO of Aptel. Aptel is a leader in traceability, and traceability is a key to optimize the supply chain. And our goal is, uh, let's be frank, we want to be uh, a large, large company. We're already global with 900 company, uh, employees all over the world. So we need also to, to bring the, this expertise that we will develop together and exploded all over the world. So many companies like Covio and CGI, OpenTex, etc., uh, will be able to leverage from what we will develop as unique here in Canada, and then bring that to the rest of the world. Because you know, I, I, I'm a 
strong uh, advocate for sustainable uh, sustainability uh, to, uh, for the future generation. So if we solve, if we have the best supply chain in Canada and sustainable supply chain, it won't help. Uh, so we have after to sell that all over the world. Like if we develop fishing uh, expertise, well, we're gonna have sustainable fishing. Well, <coughs> we need to bring it everywhere around the world. Okay. Um, this question for the for the three super cluster reps on stage. Uh, I asked around a few smart people, what, what's the one question I should ask? Uh, and they all said the same thing, which is, what does success look like for this program in five years? And and you know, how do you how does the public that's funding all this, or partially funding all this, I should say, uh, assess and score your performance? So five years or even ten years out. Why don't we start with you, Jen? Sure. We've actually um, the the wonderful thing about our initiative, we're um, tremendously oversubscribed. I think the maximum that the federal government was offering is about 250 million of matching. So we are uh, we've got a number of projects that are earmarked uh, to start that are oversubscribed. So we're very much creating KPIs that are are we realizing the benefits of each of these projects that have been mapped out. So um, there's going to be some some key initiatives around uh, key initiatives around that reporting, which is both the economic impact impact, the job impact, and the trade impact. Uh, because a key part of what's happening with the advanced manufacturing piece is that, interestingly enough, it's the larger international manufacturers that are resident in the Toronto Waterloo Corridor that were bemoaning the fact that the smallest local members of their supply chains weren't investing enough in R&D and leading technology. So through this initiative, we're going to be helping those smaller companies move along. And what these international firms are then hoping to do is as we create best practices here, how do we help those companies, those domestic companies, get access to other parts of their organization globally. So there'll be a scale play there. We know from a lot of the work that we do on trade and helping companies go outbound that uh, for every $100 million of trade that you're doing, it's 1,000 jobs at home. So we're great. we've got a number of KPIs that we'll be measuring against and reporting on. Now, just a follow-up question on that. I, I, one thing that stood out uh, from your application is what I, I read to be pretty aggressive numbers. I think you talk about creating 170,000 jobs over a decade, which would represent more than half of the jobs lost in manufacturing over the last 12 or 13 years, increasing Canada's GDP by a cumulative $157 billion, which is large. Uh, obviously, boosting R&D spending and even reducing greenhouse gas emissions, it's a pretty ambitious list. Are those your KPIs that we should be, should we be measuring your success against those numbers? Or do you believe those numbers actually? Because they're, they're extraordinary and, and. Yeah. We believe the numbers and they're anchored under specific projects that are sitting underneath. So I think what we need to do is measure project by project to see if the success is there and then look at the aggregate across. The one thing I would say, the Porter model uh, talks mo much more today, not just about a cluster per se, but the anatomy of a cluster. And so if we think about advanced manufacturing, it's not just the manufacturing itself, it's how do we get those goods to market. So there's a lot of work that we're doing right now on movement of goods throughout the corridor. There's jobs that are gonna be attached to that. That there's infrastructure investments that are anticipated that are separate and distinct from that super cluster initiative. And so I think as we judge in, in the fullness of time how effective the super cluster has been, it's both the project itself and it's about a number of other enabling projects that are going to be help, happening around it. Okay. What about you, Matt? Well, look, I mean, I, I would certainly agree with, with uh, everything that Janice just said. So maybe I'll just sort of build on that a little bit um, r rather than repeat it. Um, I think that in one level, after five years, what I, what I hope we can do is, is achieve a proof of concept um, that we will have been able to create um, a platform, uh, an ecosystem within which there is a good value proposition for an increased level of investment, business investment uh, in R&D, um, and that there are uh, ecosystems that have become more robust around those um, uh, that are that we're starting to see the signs of. You know, I'm, I'm not I'm not convinced that at the end of five years that'll be quite enough time to see sort of you know big disruptive impacts necessarily. Um, and and so the question of of what the actual outcome uh, metrics will be or what the actual numbers will be is is one thing. But I do think that the superclusters should be measured against those ambitions. Um, you know, are they continuing to make choices that are aiming at those ambitions? You know, whether whether we hit them at the end of the day or not, we'll we'll see. Uh, but I think it's very reasonable to continue to press the superclusters um, to make choices that are based on a big ambition, um, and at the same time, they'll allow them the space to uh, to learn from what they're doing. I, I think that um, 
you know, there's a really good chance that what we think this is going to look like today is, is going to be different a year from now or five years from now. Uh, so I think as long as we also create a framework that allows us to, um, you know, learn from the things that are working well and, and, and the things that aren't working so well, um, I think that that will be, that will be significant uh, as well for those outcomes. Okay. The way what does success look like five or ten years from now? What, what should we hold you to? Well, I think we have uh, several uh, ambition. Of course, the job creation. Um, and uh, so we're living in a competitive world, okay? Technology is evolving and is dissipating very fast across the globe. So we have really have to be at the edge, like our manufacturing industry need to jump in to stay competitive. And then the faster they do, the more they will have an edge, and then the more they will be able to produce and sell, and so creating more jobs. So I think it's the implementation of technology that we're looking at, AI, uh, robots, and et cetera, will empower to create a lot of jobs. And if we don't, we're going to lose a lot of jobs. So I think there's a, either you win or either you lose. But I think the super cluster is to make, make us win. Uh, the, the other impact also is like in the supply chain. Okay, our, our goal is to optimize the supply chain and find new opportunity. We're working on several projects where, uh, let's, let's take an example, the, the recycling problem that we have in Canada. Okay, before Canadian government rely, uh, relied on China to buy all our recy recycle. Uh, now China closes border. So many industry will, will die because now they don't, they don't have nowhere to sell. Uh, so an optimized supply chain, a sustainable supply chain, and reduce greenhouse effect and make sure we, we, uh, we go to our sustainability, we have to create new industry. So we will identify new industry and try to keep that here. And Canada is a, a, a raw material producer. We, we need to get more transformation here. And with advanced manufacturing, with you know, specialized uh, in, in fishing and from uh, green protein, which is the future of humanity and the West Coast, all together we can change the, the tissue of the industry in Canada because that's where the world needs to go. Let's be on front instead of watching it go. I would point out also, I think success in five years, uh, Louis may not say this and I wouldn't ask you to, but would be that uh, you are a lot richer because your company is a lot more valuable because uh, uh, it's created value uh, in Canada. I mean, this is what one of the objectives is supposed to be to create uh, global champions. So, uh, um, Ilsa and uh, Jameson, I want to throw the next question to you. You can arm wrestle for who goes first. But I want to talk a little bit about um, what's government's role now? They've, they've committed the money. Uh, they're sitting down to negotiate these contribution agreements. Um, you know, there's a lot of participants. Does, should, should government have sort of a, an overbearing role of trying, you know, sort of trying to get in and, and really uh, uh, sweat the details and make sure that the initiatives are going in a certain policy uh, driving way? Or should they just kind of get out of the way, cut the checks and let the super clusters do what they, uh, do what they said they would do? Well, that's the really, really tough part. I mean, we're, uh, we're at this interesting time now where I believe the supercluster teams have not yet sort of seen the final drafts of, of the transfer payment agreements and the, the thorny issues around managing conflict of interest and making sure that the intellectual property issues are properly managed, uh, governance and so on are, are you know, are still, still need to be, I think, uh, negotiated or... or um, uh, applied to the particular context of the different superclusters. So this is a really critical time to build this partnership between the leadership at the superclusters and the government. Um, the, I think the really hard thing from, you know, just uh, as an observer for, for government in this space is to balance the, the truly business-led initiatives, um, you know, get appropriate accountability, but at the same time let that leadership play its role, and in fact, hold it accountable for, for stepping up and playing that role. Um, and so, um, so I think this will be a test because of the scale of the investment in each of these super clusters. Um, and hopefully, we will get you know, that step up um, from the leadership teams at the super cluster level, you know, which involves people that are very, very busy um, you know, I, I don't actually believe the lack of collaboration between our industries because people don't want to collaborate. People are busy trying to win in the world. And um, so, you know, trying to make sure that we have the right uh, central nervous system for each of these clusters, 
that is accountable, but at the same time is responding to the market and not to some theoretical construct of how this should be implemented. Because if we, do, if we use these superclusters to not do business as usual, which is our biggest hope, is that this is not just a bigger version of business as usual. It's gonna have to have the oxygen to try new things and to do things differently. Okay, Jameson. Yeah, oh. I, I guess three things. Um, one is uh, one person's bureaucracy is another person's accountability. So you use the language, do we, should government be overbearing? It's a billion dollars. So the initial agreements, as a Canadian, I hope that they bring a certain level of temerity and strength to those conversations to make sure that there's the proper expenditure of that money rather than a policy direction. So that's number one. Number two, I would say to the government, it's a transformation from direct delivery to a platform model. I mean, I guess it's ironic that you're asking the question of Ilsa and I. Ilsa and I in our previous lives, Premier's office and Mars, there's, there's, an, there's an aspect of accountability, but also you have to have faith in your own process that you've chosen the right sectors, you've chosen the right leaders, and at some point, you gotta let them go. Um, I don't know where the timing of that is, but I would encourage government to move more to a platform model. It's not government-led or industry-led. It's, it's amping up everybody so that they can grow and be a little bit bigger. And I guess in the third point, um, I see a lot of familiar faces in the room. I think there's a saying we should ban, although it is true, Canada's having a moment. It, it, it's so passive. Um, we now need to move to an active phase. If we're having a moment, then we have to ask the girl to the dance, not just keep looking at her across the hall, right? So, <laughs> so this is a chance. This is, what I like about this initiative, it's, they're taking a shot. And it's different than what it has been before. So let's do something a little bit different and allow those things to grow and try to expose themselves to global competition. Louis, you wanted to add something yeah. to that? I just would like to outline, you know, uh, there is no risk for the money because, look, uh, most of the project, if not all the project that were proposed in the super cluster, even probably in all the cluster, will be eligible anyway to tax and credit and provincial and federal grant anyway. So uh, I think we were a trick by Mr. Bain. We were a trick because, you know, it, it would have been much easier to, oh, okay, I'm going to do a project and then we get the, the, the tax credit. And it, so the, the money is going to be spent anyway with or without the cluster. But the trick that worked with Mr. Bain's idea is that now the moment was right. People are scared. Business people are scared. Scared because of the disruption like the Amazon or the Uber. So the, the, the money was just a carrot because the money was there anyway. We you know, just say, oh, here's a carrot. At the end, the carrot is not so big. But what the benefit of that is those discussion. And now that the moment that people are scared and they see the super cluster as a way to innovate and stay competitive. So I think the money, you know, it won't be lost because it was already in the budget, in the tax R&D budget, and in the NRC budget, etc. So. The, 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 the thing about the cluster is people are scared and now they will collaborate because you know, fears is a driver to change. And now the fear is there and the cluster is bringing this collaboration to, oh, okay, I cannot do it myself anymore. So. Can I just respond? I hate the term, this is, we're in this moment. Because a moment sounds like it's fleeting. And I think we should be thinking about it as an inflection point. We've got some choices about what we do with our position in the world at this point in time. And the three words as a border trade we never want to hear used in conjunction with our country are in its heyday, because it suggests we missed an opportunity. So I think we need to use this as an inflection point to say, let's try something different. Let's create a catalyst for business that's going to spur the economy in a way that we haven't done before. So I think we've arrived at the moment where I want to talk about uh, thank you. Uh, well, I want to talk about intellectual property a bit and then uh, go to the audience for a couple of questions. Uh, so the government has made IP, intellectual property, a, a big part of this program, uh, stating that every supercluster needs to have an IP strategy. Uh, there are some concerns uh, that uh, a lot of Canadian companies don't really have a lot of sophistication when it comes to, to IP. Um, and then, meanwhile, you've got a lot of foreign companies that are uh, uh, joined in. Some of them are very savvy when it comes to IP. Microsoft is in four of the five uh, supercluster bids. Um, I, I don't really want to pick on Microsoft too much, but, um, uh, but I am going to pick on Microsoft. Um, uh, as I did in my piece a few weeks ago, uh, they're involved, as I said, in four of the five superclusters. Uh, they know IP. They're actually one of the most active uh, patent writers uh, of AI patents in Canada. Um, on top of a, a lot of the open source uh, stuff that's been developed. 
Uh, Louis, um, they t all, Microsoft offered their services to all of the shortlisted candidates. You turned them down. Why? Well, uh, we understood <clears throat> from Mr. Bain that this cluster has to create value in Canada. Okay? You know, this is our children. This is our country. We have the nicest country in the world. We have to create value here. And we use Microsoft. You know, our software run on Azure. We use Power BI. And thanks to Microsoft to sponsor this event. Uh, Microsoft will be a winner anyway, because if we deploy those infrastructure globally, it's most probably IBM, we use blockchain IBM, we'll use a Microsoft Azure platform, so they'll be there. But the IP, we wanted to reserve that for, for the Canadian. You know, we have Canadian leaders like OVO, OpenTex, etc. They, they need to be the one that will uh, take the, 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 the big benefit out of that. And yes, Microsoft will be there to support. It didn't need to be in the core cluster, but it, it, it's already there. It's already into our infrastructure uh, of uh, most of uh, the, the company that are run, uh, running cloud base or AI. So. Hmm. so the government stated it wants to ensure IP generated by the superclusters, quote, remains in Canada and benefits Canadians. But when you read the fine print, uh, it seems more like a guideline than a rule. And there's specific language in their FAQ that I, I mentioned in my story. How much, for each of the clusters, and maybe if the two of you at the end want to uh, uh, chime in as well, how much of a concern is this for each of you? Uh, uh, and what can groups do to guarantee that all this public money uh, won't just be used to create wealth for U.S. companies uh, and leave a limited return for Canada? Why don't we start, Jan? Yeah, I'll, we're spending a lot of time at the NGM board talking about how are we managing IP. We've looked to Fraunhofer in terms of how that model's working in Germany. We're also in touch with the Canadian Oil Sands Innovation Initiative because these are a number of major companies that have been working together on IP. So we haven't fully solved it yet, but we're trying to do a lot of research to figure out what is best practice and what can be best applied. Are you concerned, though, that your board has a, a number of foreign companies on it, like Xerox, which routinely develops IP here and transfers it out of the country? Uh, I'd say we've got far more local representation on the board than we do international. Okay, so does it suggest there's a dynamic conversation that's going to take place? No, it's a very dynamic conversation because it's, it's, I think it's going to be the crux of how do we make this work. Uh, because, uh, as I said, we've got more projects than we're likely to get uh, matching funding from the government, so we're really trying to figure out how do we best deploy this to the benefit of the businesses that are going to be the majority investors in all of this. And as I said, it's mostly local companies at the table. Okay. Matt, what about you? What, what's the level of sophistication of, uh, 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 regarding IP of the members of your supercluster? So, so one of the interesting opportunities we think is there is, is that, it, frankly, it, it is uneven um, when, you, when you look at the verticals of, of the ocean economy. Um, on, on the one hand, you have sort of, uh, you know, the defense sector, the oil and gas sector, you know, very sophisticated, very advanced players uh, in terms of um, uh, developing, uh, do, you know, conducting R&D uh, in and around the ocean. Um, Obviously, with with very notable firm level exceptions, um, you know less so probably in in uh, in some of the aquaculture and and fisheries space. Um, so as we see happening, you know again in in, in northern Europe, for instance, we think that there's probably going to be opportunities for lateral uh, tech transfer uh, to the advantage of of, um, of Canadian firms that are characterized by home headquartered uh, uh, corporations. Uh, so what we're looking to do is sort of take advantage of that um, as as best we can in in the super cluster context. Context. Um, you know, clearly there's a lot more detail to be to be sorted through, and, and as of other, others have noted, uh, that those discussions continue. Um, but I think it's it's uh, you know we, we, we want to be mindful of of how um, intellectual property is is part of our kind of proprietary advantage, but we also want to uh, be mindful of of how we're able to actually uh, enable Canadian industries to adopt and, and deploy that technology to be successful in, in, the, in the ways that they're actually making a living. Um, and those two things may be the same or they, or they may be different depending on the context. So I think we're, we're, we're um, going into it with a sense that this needs to be very much led by the, by the business objectives um, of those coming into it because it, we also have to remember that we're not setting up a framework like um, the offset obligations or, or ITBs or something where we're talking about compulsory uh, spending. Um, as much as this is an incentive for it to be successful, this is uh, you know very much companies that are going to have to voluntarily come to this um, and and make uh, substantial R and D investments that they believe there's a strong you know ROI for, or or it's not going to happen. Okay. Can I add one thing? In is just uh, the room is filled with policy wonks. Public policy is about choice, and if at the end of the day you're looking at strong IP expertise in global companies, 
and what you just described as naive or lack of sophistication in Canadian IP, which I'm not sure I'd necessarily agree with that construction, but you could set up a rule where you say no IP is going to escape the country to these companies, so then why would they come and play? You have to make a choice where you're saying, okay, we're going to set more ground rules. Hopefully, there's, we're going to trust and have faith in our folks to be able to defend Canadian interests and the governments, and also maybe get less naive and more sophisticated. So, along the way. So to that end, uh, some IP experts have suggested that each supercluster should have a non-invested industry expert to look out for taxpayer interest on IP matters. Louis, do you think that would be a, a simple answer to that? Um, well, we'll have to think about that, but I think it's a good idea. Uh, I think the government have to make sure that we do the right stuff and make sure that, the, that, that we'll have a payback. Canadian will have a payback on that. Mm. Uh, Ilsa, do you have any further concerns on this, on this particular issue? Yeah, I mean, no, I guess the other somewhat pragmatic view is these, these uh, IP and these collaborative platforms are always hard, <laughs> so it's not a new problem. Um, I agree with Jameson, and you know, the, the Oceans Cluster example is an interesting one, is can we use this to really beef up the sophistication, and can we prioritize that um, in the agreements? And I like the idea of actually an arbitrator. Um, the other reality is just that collaborative projects where the IP will be shared between the partners um, is, you know, always forces you into the pre-competitive or the near-competitive space by nature. Um, and you can also mitigate some of this by bringing actors together from different sectors. So in the manufacturing cluster, I love the fact that we have Maple Leaf Foods and the auto sector potentially dealing with the application of AI and robotics. Um, you know, the, the IP that is near-competitive there is not necessarily going to be a as contentious as it might be when two or three automakers are, are working together. So, um, but you know, let's really be smart because the global game is that we have to uh, protect our turf and uh, take advantage of the intellectual property that, uh, that is generated. So let's up our game and use this as an opportunity to do so. Okay, great. Uh, we'll take a few questions now from Slido. Actually, they're way over there. Is there any way to switch the screens? Or uh, Ilsa, would you mind reading the first question? <laughs> <laughs> I can't see it. Okay. Um, it says, uh, Do you want me to try? Yeah, sure. sure. Oh, then they changed the screen. There we go. Uh, with its geographic focus, is the supercluster undermining needed collaboration across the country to truly compete globally? Jump all. Who wants to take that one? Boy, do we have oceans across the country? We do indeed. Yeah, we've got them. Yeah. On two. I, well, so my, my, um, uh, the president of Dalhousie actually co-wrote a, uh, an op-ed in response to your article, Sean, with, with uh, Scott Stern, who, who publishes with, with Michael Porter and, and Mercedes Delgado on, on clusters to, to make the point that, uh, in fact, the regional distribution um, is a real strength because if you, the, at the heart of successful clusters are... Um, competitive advantages, you know, built in natural competitive advantages. And in fact, the, the way that it's distributed arguably has, uh, has really um, uh, provided a lot of breadth to the range of competitive advantages that Canada's been able to mobilize and put in play for this program. So I think, I think there's, a, there's a perspective there that, uh, that has actually been, we're, we're starting actually on the right foot. Would, would it have been politically palatable, though, if there had been, say, three super clusters in Montreal, one in Toronto, and none in the east, and none in the west? Well, our super cluster is Toronto Waterloo, which is the largest density of technology and manufacturing uh, in the country. So it just makes sense when you've got density, because that's also part of the whole theory of clusters, is you've got a concentration of activity in a common space, which allows for that collaboration. Um, you know, this is the age-old Canadian debate. Is it everyone, or do we pick, you know, do we pick some lanes and say, let's build these up and then see how we can transfer this across the country? I think this is a different approach, and I think the fact that we've pick some lanes and said, let's look at concentration and then let's see what we can build out across that'll benefit the country, just makes sense. Hmm. Anyone else? Uh, let's go to the, uh, yeah, uh, the second question. Uh, Who would like to read that one? <laughs> Jameson, do you want to help with that? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, what is the most relevant, important criticism of the supercluster program you have heard and what should be done differently to address it? Well, if I may add, I think uh, it's the, the worry that, uh, that the, all this, those innovations will be taken by big company 
and then let nothing to the the, the, the small uh, and the, the, the startup or those the, the Canadian company. So the, I think that's the big threat. Uh, I was proposing to, uh, to to the IZ team. You should have observer. You know, you don't just let us go and uh, because there'll be power control, etc. So the government need to be there. Uh, to make sure that it's going in the right line and benefit, because otherwise it's a, it's a big risk for the government to end up, well, oh, finally, we spent this money and uh, the IP is gone or there's no real benefit. So I think we need to have a watchdog on that. I think there's two criticisms that have been levied. One is uh, the, the initial metrics uh, listed by the government versus those that were necessarily in the submission. One was 50,000 jobs over 10 years, a $50 billion increase in GDP over 10, and that Canada would have become an innovation hotbed globally. Um, I'm not sure what our base level hot beddedness is right now. Like, I'm not sure how hot the bed is, but that's, that's a tough metric. Um, You're having a moment. I'm having a moment. That's, <laughs> it, it, but one of the, I think some of the things that are in the submissions around R&D investment, around trade, those would be interesting to, to rectify that challenge because those are the things that are gonna make us globally competitive. The second, and it's a tough one, is the corporate welfare criticism, which is how can you prove that this money is going to create activity that wouldn't have otherwise happened? And I think that's gonna be something that's gonna be up to the proponents to, to demonstrate. And I guess lastly is just, you know, um, I, I love these questions and they're, they're so Canadian. Like and I, when I think about, you know, we, wrote, we write books about Blackberry and have Canadian specials about the Avro Arrow. Um, we love to celebrate and talk about how things might go wrong. I think there's also an opportunity right now in this moment, since that seems Inflection to be the recurring point. theme, <laughs> to, to, to talk about how we can all work together and make this one a success. And so that next time when my kids see that Canadian CBC special, it's about how the uh, ocean supercluster took on the world. Uh, okay, well, the, uh, the next question is, uh, uh, who would like to read that one? Since it's all the way over there in the type. You've got a good small. voice. I got, I'm going go with it, sure. <laughs> Um, I'll pay you part of my salary for this. Uh, after. That's, <laughs> that's great. I'm just going to make the question about no. Uh, Barton just spoke about the need for speed, yet the I said SC process feels slow. Policy, contest, decisions, announcements, funding, disbursements, what gives? These are good questions. Uh, so, what gives? Well, I think the discussion are already underway. You know, the innovation. Uh, I was at Woodbridge yesterday. Yeah. There's already those projects. So, and, and assembling those projects, you know, which are innovative, have to be innovative, will, will take a certain time, and it's already started. Yes, there is the administrative stuff that may take time, but I don't think that the cluster are ready to, to say, or oh, here's the full project, etc. So the work is under, under it's going. So. I, I would agree. I, mean, I can certainly, I mean, believe me, I can understand how it feels slow. Um, but, but I'm not sure that it, that it is in every respect. And in fact, even, even just through the process of, of thinking about the, the possibility of, of what would go into the application, um, we saw uh, conversations begin that are currently resulting in, in new business relationships and, and new activities, you know, irrespective of, of, of the rest of the progress with the, with the supercluster and, and the sort of the agreements uh, around it. So I think that there's already a number of things in motion, and those things are going to um, uh, become apparent more and more as, as the process rolls ahead. And I think that the, that sort of you know, under the surface uh, set of things that are happening um, are significant and, and, are gonna, are, and are going to inform you know, these other pieces that maybe feel a little bit slower. But I think, I think that it's, it's you know, maybe a bit deceptive to, to suggest that it's, um, it, it probably looks deceptively slow. Mm -hmm. uh, I, actually, I wouldn't mind throwing in a question. I mean, I'll throw this two over to you, Ilsa. Is it okay if one or more of these superclusters fail or, or fall well short of, uh, of expectations? I mean, shouldn't they be expected of an experimental new program? Uh, I mean, like venture capitalists, if they say, if, 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 depending on the stage you invest in, if a bunch of your investments don't fail, then you're, not doing, then you're doing something wrong. So maybe you and Louis, I think you want to add to that. Yeah, I would, I would absolutely. I mean, the interesting thing as I was thinking about these five examples, I mean, they are five quite different experiments in themselves. And so I think we will learn from, you know, each of these experiments. And, uh, you know, failure may, may be business as usual. Um, so it's also not total, unless there's some, you know, giant governance collapse or something in a cluster, which is, is fairly catastrophic. But... Um, um, I agree with Jameson. I think, you know, there is a commitment from government to invest significantly. Um, 
Industry has come to the table and responded positively. There's a lot of energy around this. Um, it has been hard pulling these proposals together. I think it, you know, it, it may sound like they just kind of automatically gelled, which I think is an indication of the hard work um, that is at the core of these new forms of collaboration. So all of that investment of, of human capacity and energy and time, I think, gives us some momentum now. And um, you know, we have to be open to failure if it's going to be innovative. And uh, we have to also um, create the flexibility to change course a little bit in year three if something is not uh, panning out or we don't have the traction that was anticipated at the beginning in a certain area um, so that we can absolutely maximize this investment because frankly, we can't w afford to base waste a billion dollars on this. On one, more importantly, we can't uh, you know, uh, afford to, to waste the time given the pace of change. Okay. Louis, you wanted to add to that? It's a portfolio. I think every cluster, I don't think there is one project. The cluster will be multiple projects. So we'll, every cluster will have a portfolio of projects. And it needs to be a real innovation. So not, oh, I'm putting SAP in. No, no, it's going to be real innovation. So they'll, ha they'll be failure. And probably failure rate, you know, I'm sorry to say, I think it will be probably around 50%, if not more. Uh, that's... The, 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 you know, innovation is that, you know, you have to risk uh, and, and you fail and then you just start again. Uh, but overall, I think th those who are going to succeed will bring the benefits. Uh, uh, this is the way business runs. This is uh, the, the way life works. Sometimes you have to try and... Uh... We have a few more seconds. Uh, Matt, did you want to... Well, I would just the flip side of that is I think that the, the super clusters really should only be entitled to continue um, after, after a five-year period if, if they're genuinely creating value. And I, and I think that that's, that's what they should hold themselves to. And if, if that doesn't prove to be the case, then companies are not going to continue to invest in it, and, and, and they, will, they will fall away. So I think the, the, um, the impetus is to just constantly strive to create value in that way. Yeah. And I would say the second biggest uh, area of focus in addition to IP is the talent, the reskilling piece, because that's going to be critical as we're deploying these new technologies. And that's a key area that we're trying to unpack in terms of how do we make sure we're filling skill gaps that we're already identifying as we move forward into these projects. Great. Well, thank you all. I uh, encourage everyone here to uh, keep asking questions. I think this is a program we all need to keep a focus on and uh, keep, keep coming back to. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.